Good afternoon, and thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Susanna Bloom, the director of the defense program here at CNAS, and joining me today at the virtual fireside is General Mike Murray, commanding general of Army Futures Command. Uh, general, thank you so much, and uh, thanks for joining us here today. Thanks, Susanna. Uh, General Murray and I are going to have a chat about things or how things are going at Army Futures Command, how the Army's modernization drive is progressing, and a new effort that the Army is calling Project Convergence. Uh, but before we get into all that, I need to run through a few admin notes here. Uh, this conversation is public and will be recorded. Uh, it is being live streamed and we will also post the video after the conclusion of this event. Uh, we're going to reserve about 15 minutes at the end of our session to take questions from the Zoom audience. Uh, so for those of you logged into Zoom here, please submit your questions through the Q&A function, which you will find in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. And please also note that we will not be taking any anonymous questions, so you must identify yourself in order to get your question answered. Uh, and also for those participating in Zoom for optimal viewing, we suggest that you click on video settings in the lower left corner of your screen and select hide non-video participants. Uh, and we also recommend that you select gallery view in the upper right hand corner. Uh, and with that, I'd like to invite General Murray to make a few opening remarks. So thanks, Suzanne. It's, it's really good to see you again, uh, even if it is virtually. So I appreciate you hosting this. And as I told you uh, before uh, today, Secretary McCarthy really wanted to participate in this. And as most people know, there are things that happen in that building that preclude you from doing things. So he apologizes for not being able to be here today. And really thanks to CNAS for hosting this today. And I really look forward and I've seen your, uh, at least the proposed attendees list, um, really impressive list. And so I really look forward to the conversation and of course uh, the questions at the end that we can get from the audience. So thanks again for hosting this. Um, so, you know, when Army Futures Command was stood up, uh, it was about two years ago, a little over two years ago, uh, Secretary Esper, Secretary of the Army at that time, signed out a general order establishing the command. And, and Army Futures Command was tasked to do four fundamental things. One was to uh, begin to describe uh, what a future operational environment could look like. And I use the word describe and could intentionally. It's not defined and not will because the one thing when you start thinking about the future that you can guarantee is you'll be wrong. Um, the second piece of that was to develop concepts uh, that would work in that future operational environment. Multi-domain operations was the Army's first stab at that. Uh, that concept, we're in the process of transferring and we begin to look further into the future. The third piece of it was what type of organizations will you need uh, to fight that concept in what that future could look like? Uh, how does the Army need to restructure itself? What types of new different do in different formations? How do we need to reorganize? And then lastly was to develop the material solutions to support those organizations, those organizations would use in that concept in that future operational environment. Now, in a perfect world, all that kind of happens sequentially. And in the reality of what is, it kind of happens all together. So we're still very much focused on those four fundamental tasks, along with the thousands of other things that have been given to us over the last couple of years. And underlying all that was Army Futures Command's job to what I will describe as driving unity of effort across the modernization enterprise. And it, it is broad and it is deep across the Army. So it's we've talked about unity of command, and I don't have unity of command, but driving unity of effort across the Army to ensure we accomplish that modernization. So over the last two years, and here most recently in the COVID environment that we're living in, I have been really proud of the entire team, the entire team being the Army, and the entire team being Army Futures Command as part of that. Uh, we, have, we have grown from about 40 when we uncased the colors to well over 26,000. Um, so it's, I used to describe it as a startup managing a merger, but we're well past that point right now. And I do think that we have established momentum and we are providing that unity of effort across the Army. And then recently in the COVID environment, and we've talked to other people about this, we have not lost a beat in our modernization efforts, uh, even in a COVID environment. And we'll talk a little bit about project convergence you mentioned, uh, but we've just recently completed, uh, we're almost completed with a limited user test at, at White Sands. COVID bubbles, uh, not a single case of positive with well over 500 people on the ground in close proximity. So we have not missed a beat. 
The other thing that I would just mention up front is, uh, you know, this is a team sport. And so closely partnered with Dr. Bruce Jetty as the Army Acquisition Executive. The in that that material piece I talked about, it's also the technologies and it's the task is actually deliver support the delivery of material because we cannot do this without our acquisition partners. Um, and then we've taken some several steps within the requirements process because most of you are familiar. If you go back just five or six short years ago, it was taking us on the order of 10 to 15 years to put material in the hands of soldiers. And we were doing a pretty poor job of it in terms of new development. Um, so, and I'm not going to run through the list, but most people could, uh, the, the failed new developmental programs across the Army. So we've instituted a couple things to shorten process. We're doing min value prototyping and soldier touch points. Uh, soldier centered design is another way of saying it upfront in the requirements process. We're not locking down a requirements document until we absolutely have to. We're basing material development on scenarios and real world missions that we know we will have in the future. And so there's an operational demand for the requirements we're creating. And then this, and it sounds so simple to get soldiers involved in the process up front uh, that it should be a no brainer, but it wasn't. Uh, we weren't putting material in the hands of soldiers till well into the process, almost too late to make any change to the requirements document. So that early upfront input from soldiers, min value prototyping, Congress has been a big part of this in terms of the, the OTAs and MTA authorities they've given us over the year, which has really helped speed up the acquisition process. The requirements process is going from five years just to lock in a requirement in some cases down to three to five months for the, the high priority programs. Um, and there's lots of examples that we can talk about. And then eventually, and hopefully we'll get this a little bit more in terms of question and answer, is what you mentioned um, is Project Convergence out at Yuma Proving Ground, which is, I mean, I'm really excited about Project Convergence. You know, eight months ago, um, we were talking about 31 plus three signature systems, the plus three being in the, the RCCTO, the Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technologies Office, led by Neil Thorogood, the 31 signature systems that the eight cross-functional teams are managing. And it, it just dawned on me way too late in the process um, that, you know, when you add up the capabilities and you get to a, a total I mean, the sum of all that should be greater than the total that you get to. And so how do you start to combine and connect all these things so they're, they interoperate, that they create effects amongst them? And, and really, it's bigger than just the 31 plus 3. And this is this concept, and it's really the JADC2 concept, which I know we're going to talk about. It's sensor to shooter. It's artificial intelligence. It's machine learning. It's the network that will support all that. It's autonomy, it's robotics, and it's really the, the underlying data architectures and how we manage data. Because when you boil it right down, it all comes down to how you, the data and how you manage that data. And what will almost certainly be a, a highly contested environment that will be operating in the future. And do it within a joint context, I think is an important part of that. And you know, there's been lots of examples in the past. John Boy came up with the concept of the OODA loop and operating inside the enemy's OODA loop. Um, within our field artillery community, we call it D3A. Uh, uh, detect, decide, deliver, and assess. Um, and what we're really trying to do in Yuma is all of that, but with machine learning, artificial intelligence, deep sensing, and how do you how do you speed that process up so that we can ensure in the future we are able to see first, uh, understand first, decide first, and act first, which I think will be a decisive advantage on a future battlefield. Um, and so, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to get through the the questions here, what the the audience has to say, and I really again appreciate you and and CNAS hosting this. Well, thank you so much uh, for those remarks. I know I've got follow-up questions on all of the items that you mentioned, uh, and I know, see our audience has already started to populate that Q&A box. Uh, audience, please continue to do that as we go on here. At any time, you can drop a question in there, uh, and we'll get to it uh, at the end of our session here today. Um, so, sir, I actually want to start, you know, more or less where you started, which was with a little bit of stock taking on, you know, Futures Command two years in. Um, 
And you mentioned kind of a couple of key accomplishments and in particular, you know, it's been impressive how the army, other services as well have really taken new and expanded authorities for things like rapid prototyping and, and leverage those and use those. Um, you know, what I see is the unfinished business in that space is, is actually being able to field some of those systems at scale on a timeline that's shorter to what we're accustomed to. And I was wondering if you could kind of talk a little bit about that next step, right? So how are you thinking about getting over the valley of death from some, you know, really cool promising prototype into a, a system in the hands of soldiers at scale? So uh, I think a big piece of that, Susanna, is is that partnership I talked about with with ASOL. And I, and I think, you know, Dr. J and I got a, a great relationship, great partnership, but that's really at the at the institutional level. Probably most important to me is the partnerships that are forming and have formed and are very, very strong uh, between the program executive officers and their program managers and the cross-functional teams for, for the signature systems. And I think it really applies across a lot of programs. So the one thing that I learned early on, uh, it actually it took me way too long to learn this, but within the first year or so, is we've also got an organization called the Army Applications Lab. And those that are familiar with Softworks and AppWorks, it's similar, not identical, but it's a way of looking out for innovation. And I, and I only use this for an example, is I spent a long, a lot of time the first year traveling around the country finding really cool technologies and things that I thought would solve Army problems. And I would try to bring them back to the Army and find a problem owner. And they were, they were nowhere to be found. And if you don't have a problem owner up front, so we just reversed the process. So we're, we, in the last year or so, we have been identifying key problems that the Army is trying to solve. When I say the Army, it, it could be a cross-functional team director, it could be a PM, it could be a PEO. And then we go searching for the technology to solve those specific problems. So you have the problem owner up front, because if you're going to get across the valley of death, you need to have ownership by the people that will control the money on the other side of that valley of death, which is the program managers and the PEOs. And so we're focused on solving problems that people are interested in solving in solving. And, and be honest with you, we are bypassing some really interesting technologies. Um, in some cases, because there is no problem owner. In other cases, I may be able to transition something that's very early in the S&T stage in one of my labs. And we have some examples of that to continue to mature the technology. And then we're keeping a close eye on the technology we're passing by. We built a database of technologies that have been presented to us because there's no understanding of what the problem may be five years from now. Uh, and so we can go back and go through that database and understand. But it's you get across the valley of death, it, I think it's it's ownership of the problem we're trying to solve across the entire modernization enterprise. And I'm glad that you mentioned the money there, actually, because in, it is a huge obstacle to getting across the valley of death, right? In that, you know, the Army has responsibilities to sustain a, a substantial and, and capable legacy force at the same time as you're attempting to bring in these new capabilities. And I wonder how you and other Army leadership are thinking about that balance and those trade-offs when you're building the program. So um, my my other job is I co-chair the uh, equipping pay in, in the Army. I think, you know, we call them program uh, evaluation groups. And so, uh, you know, and, and the other thing I, I would thank Congress for is four years of, of adequate resources to do both is what you're talking about. And it is that balancing of risk. Um, and I, I tell people all the time, even and we're not yet, but even if I started fielding the next generation tank tomorrow, there are 20 armored brigade combat teams in the army. If you include what's in uh, pre-positioned stocks, the best we've ever done in terms of modernization is a brigade a year. So that's a 20 year cycle just to modernize. So it's not going to happen overnight. So it is a balance between how much you invest in, in keeping legacy equipment viable and current, and then how much you begin to invest in next generation. And, and I don't think you can ever afford to, just do one or the other. I think it continues to be a balance. I think uh, starting with Secretary Esper and General Milley and now continuing with uh, General McConville and, and Secretary McCarthy is what the, the Army has fundamentally tried to do is manage that risk through the process. Some people call it night court, some people call it deep dives, but every year sitting down and going through all 650 plus programs 
um, and shifting money towards not buying new old stuff, but buying truly transformational modernization, which is the way General McConville likes to describe it, is it has to be transformational. And we get an opportunity to do this. It's cyclic for the Army. Uh, if you look back in history, we've done it about every 40 years. So on the eve of World War II, we went through a significant modernization push. Uh, in the late 70s and early 80s, known as the Big Five, we went through a, a modernization push, and here it is, 2020, and it's about 40 years since the early 80s, and we're going through a big, significant modernization push. So we, we have the chance, I think, based upon the, the resources we've had, um, to do this and, and maintain that balance of risk. But, you know, right now, if you look across the, the things, the portfolios that I'm most focused on, that 31 plus 3, um, not a lot of it is in procurement. So the decisions are going to get harder in terms of how much risk you take in the legacy force as we get into procurement of those major platforms. Thanks. And I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned kind of the idea of new old stuff. Um, and, you know, looking back on kind of the 17 and 18 programs, you know, there was a lot of new old stuff in those programs, maybe because the new new stuff wasn't ready yet right um to to take advantage when the when the money truck rolled in um but i there's a, it strikes me there's another balance to be struck there in terms of incremental upgrades to extant systems versus really trying to leap ahead into something totally new and i wonder how you at futures command uh think about that ten, not necessarily tension but that balance as well in terms of um how you proceed with a modernization effort but, you know, I mentioned 650 plus, I think the numbers probably I've lost track, 670, 675 programs of record. You're never going to be able to afford to just leap ahead with everything. Um, and so there's always going to be an element, if you look across the Army, in terms of sustaining the capabilities and, in, in fact, incremental upgrades to capability. The wheel vehicle fleet comes to, to my mind, which we've taken some risk in over the last three or four years. Uh, there, there will be a bill to pay at some point in the future, but we, we, we balance that risk, I think, pretty, pretty adequately. There are a couple systems where we are taking that transformational leap. Uh, integrated visual augmentation system comes to mind, uh, which is, um, and I could spend the next hour describing IVAS. Uh, and I won't do that, but it is, it is as close as we've ever come to a full up heads up display for a dismounted soldier. Uh, with the ability uh, to pipe in all kinds of things into this this uh, visor heads up display, um, it is thermal, uh, not uh, infrared like our current night vision devices are. It is a it is a training environment in and of itself in terms of augmented reality. That is absolutely leap ahead technology. Uh, think about the the two platforms we got in future vertical lift, and we refuse to call them helicopters because they're not helicopters. Uh, truly transformational capability, you know, and we're very early in the, the digital design phase of this go around on uh, uh, Opposite Man fighting vehicle. Um, this will be a transformational capability in terms of the, the infantry carrier. Uh, I just was up at Fort Carson a few weeks ago, ago doing uh, robotic combat vehicles, and, and it, we're very much in the infa stage of that, and we were in the min value prototype. So these these were refurbished vehicles that we had that we put uh, controls in for, for young soldiers to use. So it was a combination of that soldier-centered design, robotic combat vehicles. Um, the, the, what we're doing at Project Convergence right now from, a, from an algorithm, artificial intelligence, machine learning, data structure standpoint will be transformational. So I, I, I believe firmly that you, know, you can't do everything. And it comes back to that prioritization. And once again, you know, you go back to Secretary Esper and General Milley as the chief and the secretary of the Army, um, right through to the current chief and secretary of the Army. Our priorities have remained consistent throughout, and I think that has been instrumental in terms of what we're looking at in terms of transformational change. So you, you mentioned a little bit in your opening remarks, um, driving unity of effort across the Army, but now I'd like to open the aperture a little bit and talk about the joint force. And the, the central question is my, in my mind is, you know, what is the Army piece of ensuring that that joint force is, is able to sustain U.S. military technological advantage you know, years into the future? And I, I think this has a couple of different um, 
components in terms of both concepts, you know, which was part of that four main tasks for Army Futures Command, as well as material and, and kind of how that all comes together. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So, and I'm glad you said that because my answer is going to be it starts with the concept. Um, and so the, the Joint All Domain Operations, which is the current joint warfighting concept that is being worked on by the joint staff, uh, I think it's due in December, at least in first draft, the secretary. Um, we have been a part of that from the very, very beginning. And, and you know, and, and I probably selfishly and egotistically believe that, you know, multi-domain operations was a significant underpinning to what the joint staff is working on in terms of joint all domain operations. And, and as you remember, General Milley signed that out at the tail end of 2018 in terms of our concept. Um, so I, I think you have to start with the concept. And, and of course, just like every concept, there's functional concepts. And, and we'll probably get to talking about logistics, but the Army has the lead for the joint contested logistics concept or joint concept for contested logistics in terms of how we'll support a, a fight. You know, where that fight is based is very, very important. And so picking those operational scenarios that are going to drive the concept is, is a key part of this. Um, so you can actually determine, you know, the, the, the capabilities you're going to need. And then, you know, if we don't take the opportunity, kind of that order I described you, um, to understand the concept, to inform the, how you need to organize and, and really how you need to fight. Uh, in that concept or it, to execute that concept and then the material required uh, to go along with that, I think we've missed a, a great opportunity. So we're involved with the joint staff in that concept work. The, the technology piece of it is really, you know, probably not totally, but most people would think of JADC2. So this, this command and control network, uh, it's been described variously as all sensors, all shooters, all C2 nodes. I, I think it's a little more narrow than that because we're going to be in a contested environment, a restricted bandwidth that we just won't have wide open pipes to push data through. Um, we're going to be, you know, our ability to communicate is going to be hugely contested. So, but it is this concept of, of linkage of sensors and shooters across the services. And so starting with AFWIC, um, probably a good year and a half ago, um, in the Navy and the Marine Corps specifically, uh, we have <clears throat> been talking this concept of joint all domain command and control. And <clears throat> most people would say, well, you know, what the Air Force is doing with JAD C2 and driven by ABMS is in conflict with what the Army's trying to do at Project Convergence. Uh, I would argue they're more complementary than they are contradictory. Uh, and so it's, you know, ABMS is the key. In my understanding, ABMS is the key system the Air Force is trying to drive to create this. We have a system we call Firestorm that is, is really our key system to link sensors with shooters. Um, so it's really how do you connect those two? Um, and, you know, there's an Air Force Army Warfighter Conference coming up that we're going to talk about some of this. Uh, we've got a, a day at Yuma where some of the key thinkers in the Air Force will be there. And these conversations go on almost every day. How do we make sure that we're not growing divergent and we're actually converging and understanding how to connect each other? Because in the end, it's about the sensors and it's about the data. And it shouldn't matter who owns it. Uh, and it doesn't really matter who owns the shooter either. It's the best shooter across the joint service. So, so that's a really helpful description and, and uh, you know, beginning of some of these uh, issues about coordination convergence with the Air Force and the other services as well. But I wonder if we could um, take half a step back and, and look a little more closely at this idea of connecting sensors and shooters. It's something that we hear a ton these days. And I wonder if you could explain to our audience, you know, why is that so critical, right? Why is that a, a critical piece of high-end warfighting going forward in a way that's perhaps different than it has been in the past? So uh, it's time. It really comes down to time um, and it comes down to range. So if you look within our long range uh, precision fires portfolio, uh, you will notice that we are developing weapon systems that are doubling the range of existing weapon systems almost. And then you get into the strategic fires and it's something we haven't had since long time ago during the Cold War and early in the Cold War. Um, so 
and it goes back to understanding, you know, what it is you need to do in an operational concept. So it goes back to the national defense strategy. It goes back to the focus that provided. It goes back to this concept of anti-access aerial denial. Uh, and in simplistic terms, it's it's what our near peer threats, both Russia and China, are trying to do and have done is establish standoff. Um, and so how do you start to disintegrate this anti-access aerial denial defense? It's the defensive strategy. Um, and you do it through range and you have to be able to operate, as I said up front, inside that uh, OODA loop. Um, and so, you know, back in the days of uh, Desert Storm and Operation Iraqi Freedom, it was probably okay to take tens of minutes between identifying a target and then actually putting rounds on that target. Uh, but if you look at what we envision a future battlefield to look like, it's not going to be tens of minutes. And so the ability to see deeper, and so a space layer to what we're talking about, the ability to process that information in a very rapid fashion and get it to the right shooter, regardless of service, and to get rounds on target in not 10 minutes, but 10 to 20 seconds is what we're proving out out to Yuma Proving Ground. So it's, you know, if, when I think about a future battlefield, it's going to be hyperactive. It's going to be widely dispersed because it's going to be exceptionally lethal and it's going to be at least initially fought at, at increased ranges. And so that's that's kind of the key is, and, and I'll say it again, is see first, you know, understand first, act first. And that I think that is going to be a key to winning on a future battlefield. Thank you. That's a really helpful description of, of kind of the vision of what this future battle space is going to look like. Um, you mentioned uh, these the, dem the upcoming demonstration at Yuma a couple times, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, if we were all able to go observe that demonstration, what kind of things would we see? What would we be looking for? So, uh, like I started to talk about, so we're gonna we're gonna do sensing from the the Leo uh, orbit uh, with some some assets, uh, not Army owned. So that's, there's a piece of the joint and and really the interagency fight right there. Uh, we'll do sensing from the aerial layer uh, with uh, Gray Eagle. We'll do sensing on the ground. Those will come together um, and be actually piped back to a developmental program, and we have a surrogate at uh, Joint Base lewis McCord in, in Seattle, Tacoma, Washington, um, that will process the target and pass it back down to Yuma to a shooter and we'll put rounds on target either from a, from a, a howitzer, a self-propelled howitzer artillery piece or from a Gray Eagle or from a ground platform. And right now we have some success doing that in less than 20 seconds. Um, Project Convergence 20, and their thing I'd have to tell you is it's more it's more than the technology, right? So we're using the technology also to inform the way that we're going to have to fight in the future because there's three underpinning technologies, and I am probably wrong, just like I am in most things. When I look at a future fight, it's artificial intelligence, it's autonomy, and it's robotics. We're, we're demonstrating all those at Yuma, underpinned by a, a robust, resilient network, and that data architecture uh, and the data that I talked about up front. I think those are going to be fundamental technologies that will change how we fight in the future. And I think we have to learn from the technology demonstrations how we're going to have to change how we fight and how we organize for that future fight. The multi-domain task force, which some of you have heard about, is a piece of that as we experiment with that unit. They're actually in the Pacific right now, uh, experimenting under U.S. Army Pacific. Um, then, but it's, it's in my mind, as a demonstration, it's an experiment. Most importantly, it's a learning campaign. So we, we went into this with learning objectives. You know, and we went into it, um, I would say, haphazardly, because we've only been doing this for about eight months. Uh, but it's, it's coming together through a lot of perseverance and hard work. But it's a learning campaign. It's going to be an annual event. And there's all kinds of events that lead up to it every year. So in 21, it's very much focused on bringing the joint force in. And we got a little bit this year that we'll talk about probably, uh, but the Air Force, that's one of the reasons they're coming to the DB Day so they can understand what they can get out of it and what we can get out of as a joint force in 21. In, in 22, we expand it 
and, and the Army's intent is, and I think the Joint Forces' intent is, to put the C in front of JADC, too. So a coalition join all the main command and control. So the, the UK has signed up to participate in 22, and they'll be there uh, this year. Uh, the Australians are, are talking about participating in 22. And then, you know, we continue to learn because we have almost, besides the surrogates, almost no programs of record at Yuma. So these are very immature technologies that we're piecing together uh, to understand potential, to understand what soldiers can do, and really what commanders need out of these these tools and how we will need them if we're going to fight differently in that future environment. Um, you know, it's really heartening to hear so much discussion of the other services being embedded in your efforts and, and likewise are uh, reciprocal, um, just because, you know, for several years, we kind of watched these ideas bubble up in terms of multi-domain operations and the Air Force and AFWIC, they were doing their own piece and things are going on in the Marine Corps, certainly the Navy as well. And, um, you know, it's great to see, you know, all of those good ideas coming together in a, in a joint concept. Um, because as you, as you point out, um, you know, you can't uh, service the number of targets that you'll need to service in the time that you'll have to do it without really bringing the whole team together. Um, the, so, my experience over a long period of time is when you're in the dirt and you're working on a common problem, the services work very well together. Right, it only gets hard the farther away you get from the front, <laughs> as they say. Um, so to kind of take this to a concrete example, and you just mentioned um, that you're doing some experimentation in the Pacific, you know, what does the army of 10 years from now bring to a fight in the Western Pacific? What does that look like? Can you paint us a bit of a picture? Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, and I mentioned the national defense strategy and the national defense strategy, which most everybody's read. I mean, it points the army towards Europe first and then the Pacific second. So, you know, I mentioned, you know, my look to the future um, and, and, and we do look at, you know, trajectories and it's just not military. It's, it's economics. It's, demographics, it's urbanization, it's climate change, they're all part of looking towards the future. Um, and I would say that in, in, I cannot imagine that by 2035 or even probably 2030, uh, conservatively, our, our pacing threat will be China. So I have made an effort as we begin to look out to that future of shifting our analytical capability um, towards that fight. So the long range precision fires will play a significant role uh, in, in the Pacific. Some of the munitions we're developing uh, with the types of seekers that can go after moving uh, to include uh, surface uh, targets, sea surface targets and emitting targets will play a significant role in the future. We, we just completed and it's classified so we can't get into the details, a, 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 a really a deep dive into our fires portfolio, strategic fire study so it was not so much as a tactical level, but the operational strategic level. And we did that in conjunction with both the uh, U.S. Army Europe and U.S. Army Pacific. And, and of course, their parent headquarters, UCOM and Indopaycom, uh, spent a significant amount of time with Indopaycom and U.S. Army Pacific, understanding what they need us to do, not only in a scenario, but their actual uh, op plans. Um, and then really honed the portfolio to accommodate that. Um, you look at things like the increased ranges of future vertical lift will be critical to a Pacific uh, scenario or fight. Um, investing in some new watercraft because the logistics in the Pacific are going to be harder than anything we've done in the past. And so really digging in to understand the logistical challenges as part, part of that joint uh, contested logistics piece that we're working on with the joint staff. Um, and so... You know, we'll continue to focus, uh, at least from an AFC perspective. Uh, but, you know, I can't build an army for one theater because, like I said, we'll be wrong. Right. So it's it goes back to that balancing of risk, too, is, is how much do you weight the, the portfolio one way or the other. Uh, but I do think when you look at a majority of the things uh, within uh, the things that we're most focused on, we'll have great applicability in a, in a Pacific theater and, and also a, a European theater. So I'm glad that you mentioned logistics just there because I think after this question of all domain command and control, it's probably the the 
biggest or most critical area where where the joint force needs to improve in order to cope with the threats posed by China and Russia. Can you tell us any more about what work Futures Command is doing on that question and, and uh, you know, what we should keep our eyes open for? So at uh, Fort Lee, the sustainment uh, C did, the uh, capability developers at Fort Lee, which, which work for me a couple levels down. So under multi-domain operations, there's a number of functional concepts. Logistics is logistics and sustainment. Uh, both pieces are a point of that or a part of that as a functional concept. So, the, and, and, I, and I agree with you 100% um, because once again, you look at that future battlefield, it's going to be lethal enough. And the thing I didn't mention is the proliferation and really the saturation of sensors. So the ability to hide any place on a future battlefield is probably going to be zero. Um, so, and what that mean? That means we're going to have to operate in smaller size units and probably widely dispersed. And so logistics and sustainment doesn't become easier. It just becomes harder. So we're going to have to figure out a way that units can become more self-sustaining for longer periods of time. So as a part of that, you know, reducing the logistical burden is a part of what we're looking at. So hybrid electricity, for instance, I don't think we'll ever go fully electric. It's hard to imagine someplace in the South China Sea or in Europe someplace where you pull up to a charging station for a, for a main battle tank or an infantry carrier vehicle or any of our equipment. But hybrid electricity, I think, is is absolutely a thing we're going to have to start pushing on uh, to reduce the, the fuel burden uh, that we put on our units. 3D printing at the edge is something that's being worked on. Uh, right now we're doing uh, pretty good progress within the depots, but, you know, at the edge, the ability to, to print repair parts at least for short periods of time is going to be a piece of that. Um, to things as small as reducing the size of rations and, 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 re, and reducing the amount of energy in terms of batteries we, we force our soldiers to carry. So the ability to recharge on the edge and then the ability to come up with better ways of, of storing energy at the edge. Um, I mean, there's just a plethora of things that we can think about, but it really comes down to reducing that logistical burden to include autonomy, right? So we're always going to have trucks on the road. So we've got the leader follower going on right now down at Fort Polk, where you have one manned vehicle followed by seven trail vehicles that are completely unmanned, and we're, we're experimenting with that. Um, so we're always going to have trucks on the battlefield. So it's not so much just the trucks on the battlefield. That puts soldiers at risk and reducing that risk. Yeah, thanks. I mean, that's a pretty impressive um, slate of activity in that area. Um, I just have one last question before I want to then move over to the audience questions. And um, you know, you mentioned in your opening remarks that that AFC has now grown to about twenty six thousand people in a in a pretty short time. That's really impressive. Um, and so, standing up a new command, I think, brings opportunities to kind of get things right from the outside. And I was wondering how you thought about. Um, issues of both diversity and inclusion when you were, you know, standing up that, that group of people, uh, as well as, you know, broader questions of like, how is the army thinking about recruiting and retaining people with the right skills or upskilling people that are already in the force in this more technologically advanced, uh, era? So if you're, if you're trying to get me off the stage, that was the wrong question. Um, so you know, it, it was interesting because I mentioned this. I mean, I, literally when we uncased the colors, it was about 40 people uh, here in the headquarters. And, and the question today is, would the printer work? Um, so, you know, in, in diversity and inclusion in all the ways that we've always thought about diversity and inclusion. Because I've always believed that, you know, a diverse workforce is a strength. And, but what's interesting about this workforce out of 26,000, about... 80% of them are civilians, which is a different type of diversity and inclusion that I've dealt with wearing a uniform. And then as we built the headquarters here in Austin, which is only 500, uh, one of the things that I was very focused on is I didn't want, and don't take this the wrong way, I didn't, I didn't want everybody coming, moving from the Pentagon to Austin. Uh, I wanted to look for people that thought differently than, than I think and really didn't introduce some fresh thoughts. So, I mean, we were very focused on recruiting in and around Austin and Texas, uh, other places that they weren't coming from one military installation to, you know, another, not installation, but another army organization. So we were very focused on that. So it was a different way of thinking about the inclusion and diversity, I think, in terms of how people think 
Um, and, and we actually went to an extreme, probably too much to an extreme, where we became unrecognizable to the Army. So once again, it's kind of a balance between you know, what you're asked to do and, and the makeup of the organization. I think that's a continuing thing. Towards the future, um, you know, I, I and, and once again, you know, DOD, the Army is a massive bureaucracy and it changes very slowly. Um, so there will always be a need for infantrymen, tankers, artillerymen, aviators on a future battlefield in the Army. But I think we got to think about different talent. So it's, it's, you know, if we are going to be digitally enabled, and if we're going to be, you know, a, a digital force in the future that relies on the types of things we're doing in Project Convergence, um, we've got to we've got to develop that talent. We've got to figure out how to retain that talent. And the exciting thing for me is is we have the talent in the formation. So, and we and there's a lot of talk right now about standing up a new career field or at least an additional skill identifier to begin to identify the people that are already in uniform that have that talent. Um, so two programs at Carnegie Mellon that are in their pilot phases. Uh, one is a two years master's degree program in data science and data engineering, two different tracks. Um, another program at Carnegie Mellon, I call them digital master gunners, but it's AI technicians. That's a one year track. And then most recently on the 1st of January, we'll stand up a, a software factory here in Austin. And so you, you, you have the people to build the environment, maintain the environment, and then down here in Austin, operate the environment. And, and I, software factory, I'm just incredibly impressed. Um, 25 soldiers, currently serving soldiers in the first cohort. It took us, uh, and we just advertised on our webpage. And we had, within hours, we had hits. Within a week, we had hundreds of hits. And within three weeks, we found 25 currently serving soldiers that met all of our qualifications that were signed up for the first cohort to start in January. 11 of those soldiers of various ranks, and, and that's their thing that, you know, the bureaucracy, I don't care if you're a captain, a major, or a private, if you've got the skill set, you know, we want to get you trained. Um, 11 of those soldiers on the way out of the Army because we weren't fully utilizing their skill sets and their talents. And so, they will, now, they will now stay in the Army with an additional service obligation to go through uh, this software factory. The second cohort, which starts next summer, um, within a week, we had 1,500 people interested in 30 positions uh, for that software factory. So we have the talent. Now the question becomes how best to utilize that uh, because everybody wants it. And it's going to, it's never going to be brigades and brigades and brigades of data scientists. And so how best to use it. But, you know, one of the, part of the magic at, out at Yuma is there are people recoding software every night to fix problems. And I, and I see that on a future battlefield, you know, a brigade commander, a division commander, if we have brigades and divisions, are going to have to have kids in their, in their command post that are able to recode software to solve problems they came up with that day. And so, we're at the beginning stage of this. Uh, we're growing it slowly to make sure we get it right. And the most impressive thing I think is Software Factory. It's a soldier cadre, so it's by soldiers for soldiers as we grow this capability. That's that's really impressive. Um, and and so thank you for very much for sharing that that success story there. Uh, so at this point, I am going to turn things over to our audience. Please keep your questions coming using the Q and A function. Uh, which is in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. And please identify yourself uh, in your question. We, we have quite a few questions already. So I do apologize in advance if we don't get to yours. We've got about 200 people on the line here. So uh, thanks for staying tuned and hanging with us. And uh, I'm gonna start with a question from one of our board members, Michelle Flournoy. Uh, and Michelle says, your whole approach demands that people involved in concept and capability development, as well as acquisition and adoption, behave very differently than how they have been trained and rewarded to behave in the past. Uh, and she asks, can you give us some concrete examples of how you are realigning incentives to support new behavior and a higher risk tolerance uh, that are so critical to your success? And Michelle, it's good to good to hear from you. If I can't see you, the um, so you're you're absolutely right, and, and it's 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 what people have been, people behave 
differently when they get rewarded to behave differently. And I, and I do believe that success is the greatest reward we can we can provide for people. So, and that's why Susan didn't ask me. Susan didn't ask me the question. But you know, what what am I most proud of is I, I do believe that you know what we're doing in terms of delivering capability, and, and this is from the material standpoint of it, is is going to show promise. And that's one of the things that I'm focused on, you know, over the next couple of years is continue that momentum, deliver what we said we were going to deliver, making sure that it's an inclusive effort and it's between the requirements and the acquisition community, and then celebrate that success. And so I think reward will, will and it's not going to be fast, will, will change behavior. I do think that, and, and I know you believe this, that we really don't incentivize innovation and the way we do budgets don't incentivize innovation. And so I think we've got to show some, some success and we've got to build trust uh, specifically with Congress that we can we can have some money that's set aside for innovation. Um, and we've got to show success and we've got to be transparent about what we're doing. Um, you know, it, if you're in the military, it's not really monetary because we don't do monetary awards in the most case. Uh, but I, I think like just like a lot of things in life that you show success, you recognize and reward that success. And we have ways of rec uh, rewarding success and you continue to build up on the momentum and, and sooner or later bureaucracies begin to change. And then once I think you push against the bureaucracy every chance you get. Um, and so I have not made any friends in the building over the last two years uh, because, you know, I was part of it and it didn't make much sense to me then. And it just makes less sense to me sitting at this end of it, trying to, trying to push that bureaucracy. And, and I get a lot of help uh, from the Army senior leaders on pushing that bureaucracy. So streamlining, and you mentioned risk. Um, we have got to become risk tolerant. Uh, not, everything comes with some level of risk and you cannot take so long to bake risk out of it that you deliver an obsolete piece of technology or equipment to a soldier. Great, thanks. Uh, next question, Sydney Freeberg asks, uh, which of the Army's big six priorities and 31 signature programs are moving along well, and which are you worried about? Uh, so I, I knew Sydney would get a question in one way or the other. The So, Sydney, I, actually, um, I'm not terribly concerned about any of them, to be honest with you. We've had a couple of restarts on, you know, one recent restart on optionally manned fighting vehicles, so I keep a close eye on that one. Uh, that appears to be moving with a with a different concept about how we approach industry, uh, and it goes back to the digital design piece of it as opposed to bending metal. Um, Prism's moving along well. Recent successful LUT with IBCS, um, MPF is moving along well. Uh, FBL is moving along well. Uh, Prism successful three successful test shots in very stressing environments. Uh, st strategic long range cannon is still an S and T effort. It's progressing ahead of schedule. So, and I don't want to jinx myself, but right now, uh, IVAS ENVGB is 22 months from idea to fielding and it's in use right now in Korea. Um, so I'm, I remain very confident and optimistic about all of them, to be honest with you. Now we all, I think everybody knows that budgets are likely to get tighter as we move into the future, regardless of what happens in November. Um, that is going to create some risks that we're going to have to manage moving forward across the entire Army portfolio uh, to include, you know, there's only three levers. It's the readiness, it's the modernization, it's the people. Um, but with specifically within the equipping portfolio and the modernization portfolio, that will create risks that we're going to have to manage and figure out. Thanks. Um, David Moore asks, uh, you mentioned 15 years to get material into the hands of soldiers. What is the timeline now? And I'll just add, you know, what should the timeline be? Well, so, yeah, 15 years. And so the way I describe that to most people who don't know how the, the federal government does acquisition is I've got three daughters. They're all grown now. But if back in 2010, they had asked me for cell phones and, and this coming Christmas, I gave them three flip phones. That's about what we were doing to our soldiers. And so 15 years, 10 to 15 years, no soldier input up front. Um, and the first time a soldier put their hands on equipment was at a limited user test. And then we usually change the requirements after that, which just caused constipation in the entire system. 
Um, so we're, we're shooting right now in, in the part I own is the requirements process. And so, you know, we have two channels for requirements. We have a quick fire channel, which is about three to five months to get a requirement approved. And remember that was four or so years in the past. And then for a, just a normal requirement as well within uh, nine months to 12 months. And so, you know, we, we basically cut it uh, by at least 75%, if not in some cases, even more than that. Um, then, but, you know, part of this is, I mentioned the soldier touch points and min value prototyping. The other piece of this is taking more time up front. So then when we get to a milestone decision to go into production or even a milestone precision to go into uh, tech maturation and risk reduction, we're not making changes in the requirements document. So we won't log down a requirements document until we absolutely have to log down a requirements document. And then how you write the requirements also matters. And so we've, we've taken some pages from other places and this allows us to write threshold requirements is something we've already seen demonstrated from a technology standpoint. And that's where we got in trouble with FCS is we were banking on technology and we locked in a requirements document before we knew that technology would mature. Um, so, you know, it, ENVG is a great example. And I mentioned it, 22 months statement of need uh, coming out of Korea to first brigade, uh, the first brigade fielded integrated visual augmentation system, uh, tire process, concept or idea to first brigade fielding will be about four years. Uh, intermediate mobile sh short range air defense, striker chassis, three different type of effectors on a turret on a striker, about four years from idea to first unit equipped. Um, and so 10 to 15 right now, we're averaging three to four on, on what I'm getting into production. Some will be a little longer, some will be a little shorter. Great, thank you. Um, Stephen Hedger asks, uh, you just mentioned China will likely displace Russia as your lead pacing threat in the future. What does this mean for your modernization priorities and programs, uh, especially when you reach a point in future budgets that may be flat or declining? So everything will be, at least from my perspective, everything will be looked at through that lens. And so, um, and I, I told other people this, so I'm willing to share it. In my mind, I have the one, I have a one to end list of everything of the, the signature programs or systems that we're, we're working on. Some are more valuable in, in the Pacific than others. And just like some are more valuable in, in Europe than the others. But I go back to what I, I told you, I can't build an army for one specific theater because Secretary Gates said this, right? We've, we've got a perfect batting record. We've been wrong every time when we try to predict where we're going to be fighting. And so it is, it is a balance. It is managing that risk. But right now I have almost all my analytical power focused on just that very question in terms of, you know, what is the most valuable? And then it, it will be a balancing of that risk. Um, I mean, how much do you walk away from that may be valuable someplace or can you walk away? And there's other ways of balancing that in terms of production rates, in terms of does every unit in the Army need to look exactly the same? And so when you begin to look at how much you actually need, it may not be every unit in the Army needs it to be equipped identically. Um, so there's there's lots of thought going on in terms of how to balance that going forward. Thanks. Uh, we have another one here from Christine Stevens who asks, uh, fast forward five years on the AFC software factory. What is your metric for success and how will you know the effort has had the intended effect? So that's, that's a great question because, um, I mean, we talk about that just about every day. Um, and so the interesting thing about coders, if you will, is, and, and of course, everybody thinks they need their own. Um, and, and so we're talking about cohorts of 30. So we'll eventually get to a max number, at least initial plans, a max number of 200 um, at a time here in Austin in various stages of the education process. Because part of it is basic education and bringing them to a, a level set and then capitalizing on the industry, the tech industry that here in Austin. So they'll spend actually six months working with tech industry learning state-of-the-art skills. And then the question becomes, because I've already gotten requests, you know, send me five of them or send me six of them. But this is just a different way of thinking. Do they ever actually need to leave Austin to solve, for instance, trade-off problems or the third infantry division's problems? Or can they be directly aligned to them and do all their work from a, from a central place where they have access to all the tools and everything they need? 
So metric for success is, uh, in my mind, um, a career field for them uh, that we've retained, you know, a significant number of these, these young soldiers as they come out of this, that we continue to challenge them every day with, with new problems, because I think that will be key to the retention, um, that they are properly aligned against the Army's most important problems in terms of where their skill sets fit. Um, and they're contributing to operational commanders in a very meaningful way uh, every day. Thanks. Um, I've got a question here from Alan Estevez on logistics. Alan, uh, to paraphrase him, is expressing some skepticism as to whether uh, the Army is really going to fund these things like add, you know, additive manufacturing, predictive maintenance, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Do you have any kind of thoughts on where, where those things might fall in the broader rack and stack? Well, I was, it's good to hear from Alan too. And I would expect nothing less than skepticism from Alan. The, um, and I mean that in a very kind way. So, you know, we are funding uh, additive 3D printing right now. You know, that's just the first step. So uh, there are, there are efforts within our labs to get after more advanced manufacturing, both additive and subtractive. Um, you know, when I look further into the future, uh, we've got some early research in the Symbio, which is, is just, I think, going to fundamentally change uh, the world, synthetic biology. Um, the, we've got some efforts going on within the RICTO in electrification, uh, hybrid electric. Uh, we have actually, through the old TARDAC GVSC, built electric vehicles before in, in cooperation with an industry partner. Um, and a lot of this is just is finding the resources, just like it's going to be for the 31 plus 3, to, to push this into a major program. And, and fundamentally, I don't think we can afford not to. Uh, when we begin to, to understand the challenges we're going to have from a logistics and sustainment standpoint in the future, um, there will be hesitation, but I, we're going to have to solve this problem and a lot of, a lot of things that I mentioned and, and you mentioned. Thanks. Um, I've got one more question here from Betsy Schmidt. Uh, and Betsy asks, in the event of uh, a new administration, a review of the Army's modernization portfolio, do you feel confident that the current plan is going to survive? Uh, or, or do you think, are you anticipating kind of disruption in, in the approach? Well, I would imagine it will be examined closely. Um, and so, you know, the, the 31 plus 3 are now older than AFC. So, I mean, this was established before I took command of AFC. And, you know, we've gone back and done some pretty, and, and the modeling and SIM capabilities in the Army are actually pretty good. Um, you know, the, the, a lot of modeling and SIM capability went away during the course of uh, global war on terrorism. We, we sustained ours. And the focus we put on, um, and one of the early things, even before I got here, that I asked both RAND and our analytical community to do is, is run models against the 31 plus 3 in various scenarios around the world and help me understand the value. Um, and so I think even with an administration change, I mean, if people are willing to, to look at what we've got in terms of results of the value of the capabilities, and what we anticipate will be the requirements in a future operational environment, um, they pretty much speak for themselves in terms of the value. And I just have one final question here from Lee Pryor. Uh, he asks, he or she, sorry, asks, uh, should Futures Command eventually become a joint Futures Command? Uh, how do we ensure commonality of new systems and technologies across services and interoperability and cost effectiveness and who brings it all together? Well, right now, that would be the joint staff's job. So, I mean, I, whether there should be a joint futures command, I'll leave that up to the, the chairman and the sec def. Um, but, I, but I would say that um, we have had a lot of conversation with the other services. Um, nobody yet has stood up in that, uh, you know, a major command uh, to really look at the futures. But that work is going on at various levels. Uh, AFWIC, I mentioned, and I think AFWIC's now been migrated uh, into the, the, the air staff. Uh, the Navy has a similar effort where they're looking at the future. Marine Corps absolutely is tied at the hip with us in terms of looking at ground combat specifically in the future. And then I, I do think that the joint warfighting concept and this, this joint all the main command, 
command and control uh, concept is forcing us back together. I mean, we've always had a joint concept. When I was growing up in the Army, there was always a joint concept that was done down at Joint, uh, joint Forces Command in, in Suffolk and Norfolk. Um, there was always the Joe, the Joint Operational Environment. The Joint Staff has just recently published a new Joe, which is very helpful. And so, you know, that, that concept and, and really from a JAD C2 perspective, and I said this before, that architecture that we're expected to plug into um, because the services are generally going to build things from the ground up, but they ought to be building towards something. And so that joint architecture, so that we're making sure we're not wasting time, resources, and effort building things that won't plug into that joint architecture, I think will bring the services together on those two fronts. Uh, well, sir, unfortunately, we're over time. Um, we still have a lot of great questions in the queue, and we will actually capture those and share those with your staff um, in case you want to follow up on anything. But um, I just want to thank you so much again for taking the time to be with us here today and for all these really great insights into what you're working on at Futures Command. We really appreciate it. No, Suzanne, I, I appreciate you taking the time and, and everybody listening to me for an hour, which most of my staff doesn't, but I really appreciate it. I had a great time, so thank you. Great. Thanks so much. And thanks everyone for tuning in. We'll catch you next time.